Rogers Hornsby, uh, who is a famous baseball player from back in the day, was asked what he does during winter. And he said, I look out my window and I long for spring. <laughs> Very true. And we, spring is sprung. We have a great spring day today. Uh, I love baseball, as many of you know. I uh, love baseball. And spring training has started up. Things are going well. And it's all exciting and, and good. Uh, spring training, though, is a time where pitchers and players practice the most important skill in baseball. Do you know what the most important thing to do in baseball is? It's not score runs. It's not hit home runs, although they are quite majestic. It is to get outs. The goal of every baseball game is to reduce the number of outs that your opponent have. If you take away the outs, you take away their opportunities to score, and the game is over. Each team has 27 outs. And so in the effort to get 27 outs, players do creative things. One of the greatest tricks is called the hidden ball trick. Now, the hidden ball trick is a classic. Uh, a fielder receives the ball next to a bag that the runner is at. The runner comes back. And then rather than throwing the ball back to the pitcher or wherever it was supposed to go, he acts like he throws it, but he keeps the ball in the glove. And if the runner's not paying attention, he smacks the guy on the head or on the arm. He's got the out the moment he takes his hand off of a bag. This is a fairly uncommon play. I think one happened last year. And then I think before that, the next one was uh, 2013 the previous one before that. But in 1989, and again, you would think that once you got caught by the hidden ball trick once, you would never be caught by it again, right? You would just feel so stupid. I submit to you 1989. Ozzie Guillen, who wound up being a fairly good player and won a World Series with the Chicago White Sox in 2005 as their manager, got caught by the hidden ball trick not once, but twice. Now, I understand maybe in a career getting caught with it twice, but one, twice in the same year. Like, pay attention, man. And if you go and watch the video, and you can, you can look at the clip, he's looking around the second time like, really? Like, again? Again? Many of you probably, I bring this story up because it's funny, but because that's how I feel when I get caught by the same temptation again and again and again. I look at myself like, really, Travis, again? Like you fell for the same trick, the same trap, the same way again. Like once in a lifetime, yeah, I can see that. But twice, three times, 500 times? Are you an idiot? This is how I feel about myself. We're starting a new series today, and we're talking about uh, the word spoken by the word. Jesus Christ is described as the word of God. And so if he's the word of God, if he's the embodiment of of God's spoken word, then, then the written word, when he speaks about the written word, it's significant. It's important. It's like watching a movie with the director's commentary on. You're like, oh, that's what they meant. So this next series leading up to Easter, we're going to look at what Jesus has to say about the very word of God. And he's going to provide commentary for us. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 4 today. You can go ahead and turn there, Matthew chapter 4. And we're looking at temptation today temptation. The thing about temptation is it happens to all of us. It even happened to Jesus. And so what I want us to look at today are three kind of common temptations we're hit with. We seem, tend to get very focused on our temptations. We tend to get focused on certain things, but we don't look at the bigger idea, the bigger picture. So I want to look at three big picture temptations that we're hit with and how we might combat them, how we might find an antidote to the temptations that we face. The first temptation we face is we are tempted with autonomy. We're tempted with autonomy. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So one of the themes of Matthew's gospel is Jesus is the newer and better Israel. So places where Israel screwed up, places where Israel failed, Jesus is going to prove to be successful. He's not going to fail. And so you see scenes in the book of Matthew that look very familiar and look like scenes from Israel's history. This is one of them. Jesus is led into the wilderness by the Spirit. Well, Israel was led into the wilderness by the Spirit of God, the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud. It happens in the wilderness. Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness. Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness, right? So there's some Parallels there. Jesus is tempted by hunger and by idolatry. And what was Israel tempted by? Hunger 
and idolatry. And what's really unique, what really locks this up for us, is that Jesus, all of Jesus' quotations of the Old Testament in this passage come from Deuteronomy 6 through 8, which is when Moses is recounting the history of Israel to a new generation of Israelites about to go into the promised land. And Deuteronomy 6 through 8 is recounting their wanderings in the wilderness. Matthew is a very intentional writer. He's a good writer. And why would God do this to Israel? Why would God do this to his own son? Well, Deuteronomy 8.2 actually tells us. If you want to keep a thumb in Deuteronomy, it's probably a good idea for today. Deuteronomy 8.2 says, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Israel was being tested. Jesus is being tested too. Israel failed. Jesus will not. This is a time of testing and obedience. So this is a, the major part of this temptation for Jesus, this testing, is to show that he's fully dependent upon God the Father. Look at verse 2. And after fasting for 40 days and for 40 nights, he was hungry. Duh. So would I be. I said Matthew was a clever writer. I didn't necessarily say he was a good one. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So Jesus goes into the wilderness. He's he's fasting. Now, we don't know if he's fasting on purpose or if he's fasting because he's in the wilderness and he just can't find anything to eat. My guess is the former. He's out there fasting and he's hungry. And the devil shows up and he begins to question something that God said. Now, we should be used to this by now. Satan does this a lot. He questions what God says. He's saying, did God really say? Now, what does that sound familiar from? From the Garden of Eden, right? Did God really say you shouldn't eat from that tree? Now, this one is happening in a scene we haven't read. Jesus was just baptized, Matthew chapter 3, just like what we did over here. Jesus was baptized. And after Jesus comes up out of the water, you hear a voice say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my son. So Satan is coming along, the devil's coming along, and he's saying, did God really say that you're his son? Prove it. Prove it. Take these stones and make them bread. You're hungry. You want to eat. I know you do. 40 days, duh, you want to eat. You're the son of God. That should come with some privileges. That should come with some status, some perks, right? Because you're the son of God. You shouldn't suffer hunger. That's for lesser people. That's for unextraordinary for people. That's for ordinary losers. You're the son of God. And what's more is you have the power to fix this. All you got to do is flip a switch, snap your fingers, speak to him, whatever it is that you do as the son of God, and you can prove it to yourself that you are the son of God. Don't have to rely just on a voice anymore. What is Jesus being tempted with? He's being tempted with establishing his own independence to take care of it himself. The devil is trying to get Jesus to use his power and his position to make things easier and better on himself. And we are tempted in this way constantly. The temptation to independence, to autonomy, right? One of the highest values in our country is freedom, is independence, is autonomy, the ability to do it by yourself without help from anybody else and getting all credit for yourself. And if you try to ask for help, you're a failure. You failed in some way if you ask for help in our society. We prioritize independence and autonomy. Not only do we prioritize it, we actually demand it. How many of you like being micromanaged at work? Nope. Nobody raised their hand, just in case. Nobody. Why do we hate it? Makes us feel stupid. Makes us feel like we can't do our job. Makes us feel like our boss is the one who wants autonomy and independence. Right? What about kids? Teenagers? You guys love, like, the helicopter parent, right? Like, you want mom and dad to know everything you're doing. You wanna, you, you, that's why you update them all the time. Like You're really excited that they follow you on social media so they know everything you're doing. No. Why? We want independence. We want autonomy. We see our friends. They have more independence and autonomy than we do. We should have the same level of autonomy and independence. And when we don't have it, we're tempted to rebel, right? 
Our culture equates sexuality with humanity. If you're able to fully express yourself sexually, then you are a fully human, a fully autonomous human. If you can't, if in some way, shape, or form you're repressed sexually, then you are not a full human. And that's a problem. You need to fix that. That's what our culture teaches us about autonomy. How many of you would cringe at the thought of finally moving out on your own, and then all of a sudden you get laid off, and you've got to move back in with mom and dad? Ooh. Or many of us in this room are dreading the day when our kids come to us and say, Mom, Dad, I'm going to need the keys. You can't drive anymore. Mom, Dad, I don't think you can live alone anymore. I need you to come stay with us. Or we've got a place we want you to go that I think you'll really enjoy. We dread that conversation. Why? It's not because we love driving in Dallas traffic. It's because we love independence and autonomy, and the thought of losing it is terrifying. It's cringeworthy. Being independent, being autonomous, seizing the day, whatever, it's not always bad. But it is when we let it seep into our relationship with God to the point where we demand independence from Him. This is what Adam and Eve did. They wanted independence for themselves. And they took it. They took it. But Jesus says that independence isn't the way forward. It's actually dependence is the way forward. And it shows us how to deal with this temptation. Look at verse 4. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now Jesus is not saying, hmm, the Bible tastes yummy. It's not what he's saying. It's a question of priority. He says, I'm going to put the word of God and what the word of God says over my own independence and satisfying my own needs and my own values. What the Word of God says is more important than me taking care of myself. It's a question of priority. Jesus is patiently waiting on God to end his hunger because he knows that he will. It's total dependence on God. Jesus never, ever establishes his own independence apart from the Father. Think about that. Never. He is totally dependent. Jesus is actually quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. Okay, great. Travis, why is that significant? Well, 8.3 comes right after 8.2, which is what we just read that talks about why Israel is going through the temptations and the trials they're going through. To see if they will depend wholly on God. So what Jesus is subtly telling the devil is, if I turn these stones into bread, I will short-circuit everything that God is trying to do right now. He is testing my obedience, and I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to be dependent upon him. I'm not going to set out on my own. Jesus depends on the Father for everything. So much so that in John 4, 34, he actually says, to do the will of my Father is my food. It's what I eat. It's what I live on. It's what I live by. And as Christians, we are little Christs, right? We should be doing the same thing. This is why Lent is such an amazing practice and why I'm so glad it's kind of seeing a resurgence in Protestant churches. Because you have an opportunity, you can satisfy a need for yourself. I gave up Diet Coke for Lent. It's been rough. It's been real rough. But I have in my fridge right now a 12-pack of Diet Coke. I can go in there at any point, grab one, pop the top, and, and, and drink one. It's real easy. I have the power and the ability to take care of that need for myself. But I don't do it. Why? I'm showing that I'm dependent on the Father. I'm trying to show that I'm dependent on the Father. It's a practice of dependence. I really like Diet Coke. But I want to to practice the art of dependence. I want to trust in God. That's why fasting is such a great tradition and part of the Christian tradition that's lasted right up until the modern era. For some reason, we think we don't need to fast anymore. Now, the Bible, Jeff taught us on Wednesday, the Bible doesn't say you have to fast. But it's a really great practice to get into to show that you're dependent on the Father. And don't fast just because you're like, oh, I could lose some weight. That's still autonomy. You're still trying to get something out of it, right? Sorry, didn't mean to really kill your goals there for fasting. We fast because we're capable of enjoying good things, but we choose not to for a season to show our dependence upon God. Another way to cultivate dependence and to resist temptation of autonomy and independence is to be in Scripture. 
Now you might think to yourself, well, Travis, of course, like that makes sense. But think about it. Think about what scripture is. We say it's the very word of God. Now I know most of you or many of you, and I know that many of you grew up in church. You know the stories, you know theology, you know doctrine, and some of you might even know it better than me, which is great. But I know in my life, as I've learned more, I felt less desire to be in scripture. There've been seasons where where I've actually said this in my own heart. I already know it. I already know it. I don't need to open it. Getting in God's word is not about whether you know it or not. It is an act of submission and it's an act of dependence and saying, God, I can't run my own life. I can't figure this out on my own. I need you and I am surrendering to you independence. The word of God is going to be my bread. It's going to be my food. I am depending upon it. Lastly, you can confess your need for God. It's another way to show you're dependent. I know when I am tempted, that's one of the, few, one of the times that I don't want to be associated with God. When I'm really tempted, I'm like, oh, God doesn't want to have anything to do with me. I'm kind of gross. I'm kind of icky right now. He's probably really disappointed. That's the time when God really wants us to be with him, to draw close to him. See, here's the thing about resisting temptation. Are you ready? I'm going to give you the secret of resisting temptation. You don't resist temptation when you're tempted. You have to start long before. Anybody ever see The Princess Bride? I know I did like movies last week, but I can't help it. In The Princess Bride, what happens? Uh, there's, there's the three challenges between uh, Andre the Giant and Inigo Montoya, and then, what's the, what's the Sicilian guy's name? Anyway, what? Fezzik's the giant. Anyway, we'll get there. We'll get there together. Anyway, we learn that, sorry, spoilers again. Uh, We learn that the way that uh, uh, Carrie Elways has defeated the poison that he has to drink is by he's built up a resistance, a tolerance to it. He didn't wait to resist the poison until he got in the challenge. He's been building up a resistance to it over time. If you want to resist temptation, if you want to resist the temptation of autonomy, you practice dependence all the time. You don't wait until you're, you're challenged to go and be independent. This is what Jesus has done his whole life. He's dependent. This isn't the first time he's faced a challenge to be independent. He is dependent upon the Father. And that's the same way with each of the other two temptations we're going to face. You practice it over and over and over again. So let's look at the next temptation. We are tempted with ambition. We're tempted with ambition. Look at verse 5. So then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot on a stone. So the devil transports Jesus to the temple. So we're in the wilderness. Now we're at the, the, in Jerusalem on the temple on the edge and he challenges him to throw himself off. Now, all of a sudden the devil makes a play here. He's like, oh, you want to quote scripture? Cool. I can do that too. Psalm 91 says God's not going to let his chosen one encounter any kind of danger. So let's put that to the test. It's a really unique challenge because the first challenge, it's still about the son of God, but the first challenge was, let's see if you're the son. Let's see if you're really the son of God. Make that claim for yourself. Now we're trying to see if God the father will actually claim it via action. It's one thing to say he's your dad, but let's see if he actually comes to your rescue. Let's put him to the test. Let's push it just a little bit here. You know what Satan's doing here? He's trying to get Jesus to manipulate God the Father into action. He's trying to force him into action. He wants Jesus to be put into mortal danger so that the Father will have to do something. Did you know that if you can force somebody to do something, whether through physical coercion, whether through manipulation, blackmail, whatever, you have power over them. So if Jesus does this, even in a subtle way, Even if he's claiming the promise of God, and he's like, I'm going to show God that I'm fully dependent, and he just leaps. Even in doing that, he's forcing the Father to work for him, which is not how that relationship works. The Son is obedient to the Father. And this is a really subtle undermining, attempted undermining, this relationship. We like to manipulate people. We are tempted with ambition all the time to climb the ladder, to make it all about us, to make us the center of attention. We want to be at the top of the pyramid, top of the org chart, whatever it is that you want to be the top of. Theodore Roosevelt's uh, daughter, his first daughter, actually said of him, he wants to be the baby at every christening, the bride at every wedding, and the corpse at every funeral. And that is how we are. 
We want to be the center of everyone's universe, or at least everyone that's important. And we do this through all sorts of means. We do it directly, which is the way that we measure, say, the number of people that report to us, or the number of employees we have. If we're a VP or a CEO at a Fortune 500 company, we think we're something. We've climbed the ladder. We think we're important. We also measure it on social media. How many followers you have. We want to know. That's how influential you are. If you have more followers, you're more important. If you don't have as many followers, you're less important. It's a really great scoring system in a corrupted and fallen world. We also do this indirectly. We use guilt and shame to manipulate people into being around us or doing what we want them to do. And the moment that they break out of that, and they say, I'm not going to kowtow to this anymore. We call them a toxic friend and we cut them off. We're like, oh, they just really, mm -mm. no. Some of us just have really simple ambitions. We just want everybody to like us. That's mine. I just want you all to like me. Have nothing bad to say about me ever. That's, that's my ambition in life. And it's really, really corrupting because I'm tempted, and if that's your problem too, you're tempted as well to say or do whatever it is that you think people in that moment are going to like, and it makes you really difficult to pin down. It's subtle. Ambition is a scary thing, and we go right to it like moth to a flame. George Patton actually describes this really well, General George Patton. He says, I do not fear failure. I only fear the slowing up of the engine inside of me which is pounding, saying, keep going, someone must be on top, why not you? Well, George, that engine is called pride, and I'm willing to bet that the devil had his hand up the back of your pride engine and was just making it go like a puppet. We are all tempted with this. And you know why we're tempted with this? Because the devil is offering us something we want, and it's something Adam and Eve wanted, and it's something that we want to supremacy. Either real, real supremacy or the illusion of supremacy. There's nothing wrong with being excellent. There's nothing wrong with being the best at what you do. It's wrong if doing that is about you. We are excellent for the glory of God and for the good of other people. That is why we pursue excellence. If I've never considered those two things in my quest to be at the top of the pyramid, then it's an idol. Ambition is an idol for me. But Jesus shows us a different way. He shows us that submission is is actually the way we resist this, the way we fight it. We practice the art of submission. Look at verse 7. And Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 6.16, which if you want to look over there real quick. Because look at what God says after 6.16. I'll read 16 again. That is not it. That is 8. 6.16, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. Massa was a place where the Israelites disobeyed. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord that it may go well with you and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers by thrusting out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has promised. We don't test God. We submit to His will and to His commandments. We submit. We're obedient. Our goal is not to climb the pyramid and be at the top of the pyramid. Why? Because God is there. God is there. I'm not ever going to be at the top. And nor should I, not, should I ever desire that. He's wanting Israel to submit to the plan that he has for them. And ironically enough, if they submit, rather than trying to take charge themselves, what did he say he was going to give them? Land, security, hope, peace, fertile soil, good relationships with each other. That's what he's promising if you'll just obey, if you'll be obedient. And Jesus is saying the same thing. The way forward for him is not to put God to the test, but instead to submit to what God has for him, to be obedient to him. Jesus doesn't have to put God's care to the test because he trusts him. He trusts his commandments to know that his commandments are good for him. He trusts him. And you know what ultimately happens? That Psalm 91 that the devil quotes is actually put to the test on the cross. And you might look at the cross and be like, well, God, the Father didn't come through for him at all, except that he did in the resurrection. 
Jesus Christ goes to the cross, pays the penalty for those of us who are disobedient, who don't keep the commands, who bought into the lie of autonomy and ambition. And he goes to the cross, pays for that punishment, and God honors it by raising him from the dead. And so now we have life, we have hope, if we believe, if we want that work to count for ourselves, we believe and we trust. Again, we're dependent and we submit. We submit. Submission's not a natural thing for us. It's not natural. You have to practice it every single day. It's why you have to apologize. It's why you have to own up to your mistakes. You may not think you've done anything wrong. Still, apologize. It takes two to make a conflict. This is why you enter into community at church. I can't think of a greater act of submission than joining a connect group under the auspices of, I am never going to think that I can run my own life by myself. That is a humble, submissive statement. Most of us think we're captain of our vessels. Captain still needs a crew. When you enter into a connect group, when you enter into a small group, one of the act like men groups that we have here, which has been really good for me, I'm acknowledging the fact that I don't know what's best. It's a good action for you to take. It's why if you're a child or a youth in the room, it's why you should submit to your mom and dad. You may know more than they do. You certainly probably think you do. But you may know more than they do. Jesus was, is the Son of God. He knew more than mom and dad. He knew more than Joseph and Mary. But he was still submissive to them. And so we do the same. If I only submit or obey when it's convenient for me, or when it's easy, that's not genuine submission. That's still trying to manipulate the system to make people think that I'm a good person, to make people think that I'm religious, to make people think good things about me. I'm manipulating the situation. But Jesus shows us that through the cross, there's another way. There's another way. By dying to ourselves, we actually get the things that we've wanted. We rule and reign with Christ through faith in him. So there's one more, one more hidden ball trick we fall trapped to. We're often tempted with alternatives. So we're tempted by autonomy, ambition, and then by alternatives. Look at verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. So the devil's kind of thrown all the subtlety out the window here. He's like, all right, fine. I get it. You're, you're better than me. Let's just talk man to man, spiritual being, spiritual being, whatever you want to throw on it. Let's have a straight conversation. I want your worship. And I know what you want, Jesus. You want every knee to bow and every tongue to confess to you. That's biblical. It hadn't been written yet, but it's biblical. I'll give that to you if you will just give me one minute of your worship. Now, I want you to think about how tempting this is. One, you're probably being like, well, Jesus owns it all anyway. This wasn't a real temptation. It's a real temptation. Because, yes, Jesus does own everything anyway. But we're in Act 3. Remember we talked about the four acts last week? We're in Act 3. Creation is being redeemed. This is part of the redemptive plan. But creation is still in rebellion. It's still rebelling. Not every knee is bowing and not every tongue is confessing. And Satan, I believe, is genuinely offering this to Jesus. He's genuinely offering Jesus a shortcut to act four, restoration. Everything's back to normal. Everything's good. Everyone's happy. Everything's whole. Jesus, or Satan is offering Jesus a shortcut to through, to, through 2,000 years of human history. It's like a cheat code in a video game. We're going to go to the last level right here. Boom. Done. And think about how tempting this must have been for Jesus who can see the future. Let's just take 20th century American history as things that we would like to have avoided. Segregation, two world wars, the Great Depression, 9-11, Cold War, nuclear bombs, the list goes on and on and on. Think about Jesus sitting there and being like, I could really just help everybody. Jesus was tempted with something that we are tempted with every single day. And it's five little words. The ends justify the means. It doesn't matter how you get there. It matters what happens. If at the end of the story, everybody's happy, what does it matter what I did to get there? We use this phrase all the time. Well, what they don't know won't hurt them. Yes, it will. And it will certainly hurt you. We will do whatever it takes to reach a conclusion that we deem to be good. 
Not what even, and maybe even what we think God deems to be good. And our businesses will cut corners or will submit a bid that's really low that we know there's no way we can do that work for that little amount of money. But if I get the job, then I can give some of that money to the church. Or I can be really generous with it. And it's okay because the ends justify the means. I know that the church and the Bible teaches that I shouldn't move in with my fiance before we get married. But my lease is up in two months and we're just going to save some money The ends justify the means. And even if you don't say it, even if you don't use it and quote it all the time, it's something that's written in the way that we do things. We believe that the ends justify the means. Rather than stick by our spouses in time of difficulty, we look at our lives and we think, you know what? We could tough it out for five years and probably be okay probably be happy, or we could just go through a really painful year of divorce and go our separate ways and be happy. The ends justify the means. Jesus shows us that shortcuts, alternatives, are a lie. Look at verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Jesus does a paraphrase of Deuteronomy 6.13. And Jesus' response is very simple. I'm going to do things the way that God the Father wants me to do them, and I'm not going to take any shortcuts. There are no alternatives. There is only the will of the Father, and that's it. And which is ironic because Satan takes a shortcut out of that discussion, and he leaves. Which is funny because it shows you who had the authority and the power the whole time. It's Jesus. Jesus' response to Satan was that his goal in life is not to live pain-free. His goal in life is not to avoid the trauma, the loneliness, the abuse, the difficulty, the death of the cross, but to run at it head first because it's what God the Father had for him. His goal and the antidote to fighting temptation when you're tempted to shortcuts is faithfulness. The practice of faithfulness. Eugene Peterson calls it the long obedience in the same direction. Would you rather have a spouse or or someone in your life that only did grand acts of love every once in a while, or would you rather have someone who is consistent and could be relied upon every day? That is what Jesus calls us to. Not grand moments of religious devotion, but day after day after day after day of faithful obedience. And when the temptation to take a shortcut comes the way, you'll look at it and you'll go, It's this way, and you keep going. But if you're not practicing faithfulness, if you're not practicing dependence, if you're not practicing submission, then any time those temptations come your way, you're like, okay, that looks good. Okay, that seems great. And you'll fall right off. I'm not going to demonstrate that. The antidote to the temptations that we're facing is knowing the word of God, yes, just like Jesus shows, but being able to apply it to your life, to being able to use it. I don't know where you are today. I don't know if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ or not, but that is your first step of dependence. That's your first step of submission. That's your first step of faithfulness, trusting in Jesus Christ to count for your sins. His work pays for what you did wrong. If you're a believer today, you don't get out of temptation because now you're a believer in Christ. We're faced with the same things. We practice the same things. Dependence, faithfulness, submission. Over time, when it's hard, when it's easy. You do those things, and you know what you are? Successful Christian. The measurement of a follower of Christ is faithfulness. Sticking with it when it's difficult. Let's be faithful believers, and let's stave off the temptations of autonomy, of ambition, and our strong desire to chase after shortcuts and alternatives through faithfulness, dependence, and submission. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you're a good God because you didn't just leave us to deal with these issues on our own. You didn't even just find a way to take care of our problems from a distance. No, you put on flesh, you dwelt among us, and you showed us You encountered every temptation to the maximum strength that you could bear, and you succeeded. You were faithful. Where Israel failed, you did not. 
And so God, we do want to build our life around you. We want, to, we want to build our life around the God who sacrificed so much, who was more than just our example. He was our payment. And so God, I pray for each person in this room today that you would call them into deeper levels of dependence and submission and faithfulness today, that we would leave out of this place more resistant to the, the, the hidden ball tricks that Satan tries to use against us for your glory for your honor and for the good of those around us. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.